Hello, my name is Jane Friedman, and welcome to my presentation on the future of publishing, seven things an author should do. First things first, you must have a website. It's what I call your hub, meaning it's the center of all of the marketing and promotion activity that you might be doing online or offline. Eventually, all things kind of filter back to this hub. It's where you send people for more information for the official story of what you do and why you do it. Hopefully many of you already have this in place. If you don't, it's time to get started and you can buy the domain name based on the author name that you publish under and easily get a site up and hosted usually within about 15 minutes uh, using any of the popular hosting services today, such as Bluehost or GoDaddy or HostGator or Media Temple. Any of them will do fine. You just need to get your website up and start that process of having your online business card available to readers, to influencers, and to the media. It's essential for today's digital age author. Second, once you've got a website, and especially if you've had a website for a long time now, you need to be thinking about how that site is friendly to mobile environments. You have to be more mobile-minded about both your content as well as the marketing and promotion of that content through your website. So there are lots of different shapes and forms of mobile. I'm gonna talk about some of the most important aspects of this. To begin, you'll wanna take the URL of your website, your author website, and run it through the mobile friendly test available from Google. If you just Google Google mobile friendly test, you'll come up with the page uh, that I'm showing you here on the screen. And Google will tell you how well you're doing on the mobile front if your site is ready for <clears throat> the mobile world that we're all now living in. It will also give you some specific feedback on how to make your site more mobile friendly if it isn't already. There are lots of other tools online that will run this type of mobile friendly test. Uh, Google isn't the only one. There's also one called SiteGrader that does a very nice job. It's free. So one thing that is often asked, especially for those who don't have a mobile friendly site and aren't quite sure what to do about it, and they say, well, how can I solve this issue? And WordPress is probably the number one shortcut to having a mobile friendly site. It already follows many of the best practices of website and mobile design. It's also search engine optimization friendly. So if you can, move to WordPress and that will solve a lot of your problems right away. Another interesting thing that's happening on the mobile front is that both Google and Facebook, as well as Apple, and I'm sure there will be many other companies coming down the line, they're all very focused on presenting mobile-friendly versions of content. Uh, partly this is a result of all of the advertising that has weighed down websites and blogs that makes pages very slow to load. So places like Google and Facebook are trying to create ways to load content faster for readers on mobile devices. So this has resulted in two programs you may have heard about. One of them is called Google AMP. AMP stands for Accelerated Mobile Pages. And what you're seeing on the screen now is an example of Google AMP pages from some major publishing companies. These are versions of web pages that load faster because they don't have a lot of things that slow down the loading of the page, such as ads or JavaScript. Facebook Instant Articles is very similar in concept, just executed a bit differently. And you'll see that the mobile versions of Google AMP and Facebook Instant Articles are actually quite similar. So you might be wondering, oh, before we go on to number three, how do you make your site or your blog compatible with these ways of loading mobile content? Uh, if you're using WordPress, yet again, another reason to use WordPress, you can find plugins that will help prepare your site for Google AMP as well as Facebook Instant Articles. Uh, in the meantime, uh, you can certainly ask your web developer or designer, if you use one, about this and see if they can offer you any advice or solutions. It is still very much the early days for both of these programs. There are certain to be many changes ahead, but having a mobile-friendly site, even before you think about these two programs, is priority number one. And especially for anyone who's blogging, 
Uh, these are two programs you'll probably need to start thinking about before long. So number three, now that we've covered off your website and its mobile friendliness, let's think about how you describe yourself online, especially through social media, which are the spokes that lead into the hub of your website. Many people are uh, maybe a little bit too casual or uh, not as consistent or strategic as they should be in how they describe themselves across their many online profiles. Being consistent really helps with your discoverability through search. It sends certain signals and you want to reinforce the signals that tells people what sort of material you write or what you want to be known for. So I can't emphasize enough that language matters when you're writing these descriptions of what you do. So you'll see here in the search results um, that I have up for myself through Twitter and LinkedIn and Google+, you'll notice that there are certain themes that get repeated quite a bit as far as being in publishing and digital media, helping writers. You want to have the same kind of consistency across your bios as well. So I often find on Twitter, since I'm active on Twitter probably more than any other social network, I, I find that the bios there tend to be not so great. And hopefully nobody watching uh, is either of these two people I'm showing you, but these are two people who aren't really doing justice to their online bio. It's not giving me enough specifics about what they write or why I would be interested in what they're doing. Uh, one person's using hashtags, which can be useful, but notice how none of the hashtags seem to go together. Poetry, murder, children's, romance, mystery, like there's, there's a lot there. And you do need to focus on one or two things that you want to be known for. So if I could offer you a checklist for this process, first of all, to the extent that you're able, Use the same name for yourself across all online profiles. Use the same naming convention whenever possible. So whatever your handle is, whatever your profile headline is, try to be consistent in that naming. Always link back to your website. Always, always, always. Because that, again, helps reinforce search engine optimization signals uh, that we want to help increase the ranking of your site and of your name tied to specific types of content. Mention consistent keywords in your bio that describe who you are and what you do, and double check on how your profile shows up in search and customize further as needed. Number four, improve your imagery and your video. And this is acknowledging how much more important images and video are to our online experience, whether we're on a mobile device or on our desktops or laptops. Lots of fascinating studies and statistics about how images and video affect our engagement. So for instance, posts on social media, if they have a visual, they'll get uh, more 94% more visits. Uh, so if you're posting a link on Facebook or on Twitter, you'll get that many more visits if you have something visual that goes along with it. Photos posted on social media tend to get liked twice as more than other types of posts. Videos are liked 12 times more, and videos on landing pages are likely to increase conversion rates by a significant amount. Now, understand that some of these statistics that I'm sharing with you are very broad in general. They're not specific to books or to the publishing community. It's very broadly across all brands and industries. So there's naturally going to be some variation. But by and large, just about everything you do online can be improved if you're adding something visual to it. As an example, here's a screen capture I just recently took of my tweet deck, uh, all of the different columns I have going, and notice how the images really pop out and they draw your eye in a way that just the text ones don't. And this is a very consistent theme, regardless of what social media site you're using, whether that's Facebook, um, or even just solely visual sites uh, like Pinterest or Instagram. So there's no excuse today to not have good visuals, and that's because the tools to create them are free and so easy to use. They make you look a lot better than you really are at design. 
So one of the most popular tools right now is called Canva. If you go to canva.com, you can uh, start a free account and start designing things right away to use on social media or on your blog or even things to print out. Frankly, it can do a lot of wonderful things for you. Number five, explore your entire demand curve. So this takes a graph to illustrate properly. If we think about all of the potential things that you offer, that you have to sell or to give away for free, they fall on a curve known as the demand curve, where as the price goes up, you have fewer people who are probably willing to pay that price. And as the price gets lower or approaches free, there are more and more and more people who are willing to take you up on that offer. For much of publishing's history, there's really been only one point on this demand curve, and that's the print book. That $15 paperback or $25 hardcover, that's the sole thing that you had to choose between when it came to a print book and maybe, maybe a cheap mass market edition. Today, there are so many other points on the demand curve. If we look at it again from a more traditional standpoint, print book is still, you know, kind of squarely in the middle of things. If you're doing some sort of ebook giveaway, that falls on the far right. If you're doing a more customized personal event, like a, an author event where everybody gets a signed copy, let's say there's a $50 entry fee, you know, that falls further to the left of the demand curve. And you can really keep going left and going left and going left. Uh, maybe you do a special one week cruise with your most ardent fans and people are paying a premium price for that and maybe only 10 people can come. So this is really only limited by your imagination. And same goes with the, the very far right end of the curve. There are so many things that you can give away for free, like serialized versions of your work where you split everything up into, you know, five minute reads and distribute it through Wattpad or some other type of platform. Or your blog is one of the classic examples of giving something away for free. If we look at my own personal demand curve as, as Jane Friedman, you know, I have many blog posts at my site that people can read and enjoy for free. And then I have a print book if people want a more curated, edited version of my advice. And then I have a full 24 lecture series video course on how to get published that, you know, costs several hundred dollars. So I've got many different experiences to offer people who are interested in what I have to say and or interested in my content. Obviously, this session that I'm presenting to you is an example of something along this curve. It's a free session uh, that you're enjoying. And maybe some of you, if you've never heard of me before, will then end up at my site and end up purchasing something. Number six, mine information useful for reaching and talking to readers. And the way this connects with the future of publishing is the fact that there are so many more tools and websites that give us access to how people behave, what they're doing online, and if they're going to be interested in our book or in our content. So for instance, if you use any form of social media, especially Twitter, if you go into the analytics of that, which are available to anyone who uses the site, you can get a sense of who exactly you're appealing to and what their interests are and where they live. There are also some really fabulous tools from a company called Moz. Uh, one of them is called Open Site Explorer, another is called Follower Wonk, and these allow you to dive really deeply into who you're currently attracting, how how the people you're attracting uh, are similar or not to who your competitors are attracting, and it gives you all sorts of ideas and strategic insights into where you should be active that you might not already be active. Also, if you haven't been using or looking at Goodreads and library thing, these give you a lot of insights into how your readers talk about books, who your competitors might be if you're not already aware of them, and how to describe your books in a way that helps them be found. There's a really cool tool uh, at library thing, which is like Goodreads. It just hasn't caught on in the same way that Goodreads has. Uh, they have this tool called Tag Mash where you can type in some keywords. Uh, and you can see here, I use the keywords New Orleans fiction and vampires. 
if I bring all those keywords together and mash them up, what sort of books fall under uh, the intersection of those words? And so it's giving me, of course, Anne Rice at the top of the list there. Uh, but you can see that there are some other authors that pop up there. There are some other su suggestions of related tags. And this is one way you can begin a search for what's the community like around the topics and themes and places that you write about. I was recently at Digital Book World in New York City, where Peter McCarthy of Logical Marketing gave a really in-depth presentation about using online tools to research your audience and better understand them. He went through really a step-by-step -step presentation of how he researches audience, what tools he goes to, and how he understands what, what readers are like online. You can get that presentation and, and go through it slide by slide to see his process. It's at the bit.ly link there on the screen. I highly recommend it. If this idea or this challenge of finding your reader online, if like that's it's kind of been eluding you, like you don't know where to go and, you, and you're uncertain about who your reader is, this can really help you start to grok what it means to know your audience in an online environment. Number seven, you always want to make your most important or any important or maybe any marketing effort, period. You wanna make efforts trackable so that you can improve over the long terms and so that you don't uh, do more marketing that's basically not making you any sales or building your platform or achieving whatever goals you've set for yourself. So this brings us to a, a really interesting situation or question of what's your funnel? And a sales funnel is something that's existed long before the internet, long before the future of publishing talks uh, started appearing. And the sales funnel is really about how you make people aware of who you are or aware of your books, how you interest them and then move them down the funnel to finally take action and to make a purchase. So particularly in online environments, we talk about conversion rate, which is what percentage of people can you get from the top of the funnel to the end of the funnel to make a purchase? Of course, when we start talking about the funnel, it raises uh, some very pointed questions about what are you doing to attract awareness of yourself and your work? What is it that you're hoping will lead to a sale? And some authors I find actually can't answer some of these questions. They're kind of expecting it to happen just out of thin air. Well, one of the first things that you can do is install Google Analytics on your website so you can start to develop a baseline of data about how people are finding your website, where they're coming to you from, and what efforts uh, you're putting forth or what media hits you're receiving, what, what is actually moving the needle on getting people to your site in the first place. And analytics has a way of allowing you to set goals, meaning that you can say, I want to know how many people end up at my site from Facebook who actually then do X. And X could be anything from sign up for my email newsletter to click this link to buy my book at Amazon. And so you can start to measure what success rate you have based on how people end up at your site, whether that's through social media or search or an advertising campaign or something else entirely. Now, some people are intimidated by Google Analytics. If you're one of those people, you can actually find some really cool dashboard templates to lay over your analytics that will help interpret the data for you. If you go to the site Dashboard Junkie, they have some free uh, dashboard dashboards for you to use and apply. And you can also find lots of them circulating on the web for free. Just run a search for Google Analytics dashboards. Now, in addition to the analytics that you'll have through Google and also through your other social media uh, sites where they offer you the metrics, some of the helpful tools for tracking your efforts are link shorteners and affiliate links. So basically this means that every time you use a link, whether a link to your website or a blog post, a link to Amazon, a link to somewhere else, if you use a link shortener, that allows you to see specifically how many people clicked on the link. 
And so if you really want to get into measuring your efforts, it's you'll probably want to start generating unique links in each specific channel, in each specific marketing campaign. You know, this does mean you'll end up with hundreds, if not thousands of links, but this is what really allows you to drill down into what's working. So the link shortener is part of what tells you where you're getting the clicks. If you use something like Buffer, that can also help you with link shortening. Then if you're an Amazon affiliate, you can add another layer as far as tracking how people uh, find, find your book and come to purchase it specifically through Amazon as a retail channel. If what I just described sounds a little intimidating or confusing, there's also another site you can use to help you with this process called clickmeter.com, but it does involve paying money and you may or may not be at that level yet where you actually wanna to pay to know some of these figures. If you use a combination of Bitly and Amazon affiliate links, it's going to tell you a lot about where people are clicking. So for instance, if I just used very specific links to reference my book only on Twitter, I only used another link on Facebook, I used another link only on my blog, I used another link only in my email newsletters, within a very short time, like within a month, you would start to see which links people are actually clicking on. And if you're using the Amazon affiliate links, you're also going to see which ones actually lead to a sale. So at, at a base level, even if you just distinguish the links that you use by social media site and by uh, whether it's your website or whether it's your email newsletter, that, that by itself will tell you a lot. And finally, something interesting for anyone who's selling direct off of their website. If you're using Gravity Forms, which is a WordPress plugin, and Gravity Forms is a way to build a form on your site that people fill out to register or make a purchase, Gravity Forms will tell you what your conversion rate is on any form anywhere on your site. And so you can see here, I've got a little screen grab of some of the contact forms at my site and what percentage of people actually complete them. No surprise, the general contact form has the best conversion rate at 65.8% uh, because uh, there's no fee associated with contacting me. So that wraps up the seven things you need to do to prepare for the future of publishing. If these topics interest you, I encourage you to take a look at my paid newsletter for authors called The Hot Sheet. It comes out every two weeks on Wednesday. It reports on industry news and trends specifically for an audience of authors to advise you on the best, uh, the best wisdom uh, and information we found that might affect your future choices, uh, business choices specifically. That's $59 a year, and you can sign up for a free trial at hotsheetpub.com. And if you'd like to know more about me and check out more of my advice for writers, uh, my site and my blog are at janefriedman.com. Thanks so much, and enjoy the remainder of the Indie Author Fringe Festival. <laughs>